It just gets worse. More revelations about the depraved crimes of Jimmy Savile. He abused young children, the elderly and even dead bodies in a mortuary over decades of unrestricted access to hospitals and institutions. I want to apologise on behalf of the government and the NHS to all the victims who were abused by Savile. Also tonight, a FIFA bites back. Luis Suarez is banned from all football for four months. I am innocent of the crimes that I was charged with, and I feel vindicated by the unanimous verdicts. Rebecca Brooks breaks her silence days after being cleared in the hacking trial. And the rise of the super rats, the rodent epidemic sweeping Britain. is ITV News at 6.30 with Mark Austin and Charlene White. Good evening. New investigations into the crimes of Jimmy Savile have revealed shocking details about the extent of the abuse he inflicted on NHS patients. Reports into his behaviour at 28 hospitals and institutions speak of truly awful sexual abuse over four decades. He abused victims aged from just five to 75 and even dead bodies in a mortuary at Leeds General. Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt has apologised, saying Savile's actions shake our country to the core. A warning, this report from our political correspondent Carl Dinan contains more distressing details. Broadmoor should have been a place of safety. Instead, patients found themselves locked in with an opportunistic sexual predator who had unrestricted access and was allowed to continue his abuse unchecked. And all the time, he was one of the most famous men in the country. He could come in day or night. You could be locked up in seclusion and he would open the slit and look at you and you knew that if you challenged him, you'd pay one way or the other. You know what I mean? He could do anything. Today, the health secretary said sorry. I want to apologise on behalf of the government and the NHS to all the victims who were abused by Savile in NHS-run institutions. We let them down badly. Amazingly, Savile was even able to install a friend, Alan Franey, as general manager at Broadmoor. Today, he too apologised. I am very sorry for the victims, absolutely, of course I am, across the whole of the NHS. But I have nothing else to say at the moment, I'm sorry. OK. Thank you. Because of the difficulties of talking to former patients of Broadmoor, the full extent of Savile's abuse at this hospital may never be known. But almost as shocking as the access he was granted here is the scale of the abuse that he perpetuated elsewhere. Today, 28 hospitals reported abuse involving Savile. Between them, they uncovered 98 allegations. Three more, including Stoke Mandeville, have yet to report. 60 people alleged abuse at Leeds General Infirmary alone. They were staff and patients aged from 5 to 75 years old. And it was at Leeds General Infirmary that Savile claimed to have abused the bodies of dead patients in the mortuary. He even said he'd had jewellery made out of glass eyes taken from corpses. For Savile's surviving victims, his abuse is not just part of history, it is a painful daily reality. I hate him. I just want to thump him and thump him until he disappears, but he's never going to because I can still feel him, I can still smell him. Many of Savile's victims are now suing his estate. Their lawyers say questions remain unanswered about whether Savile had help in getting away with it. They certainly are unanswered. How on earth was he able to get away with this in NHS hospitals? Well, we got some new answers to that today. We already know that he deployed a mixture of charm and bullying that some victims weren't listened to. But there were management problems as well, we heard today. At Leeds, there were weak internal controls. The leadership there lacked curiosity, say investigators. At Broadmoor, the situation was almost chaotic when he came in. In fact, he was brought in to try and improve the image of the hospital, something investigators today said now seems desperately ironic. In short, these places thought he was doing them a favour. He wasn't. He was taking advantage. Defies belief. Carl, thank you very much indeed. 
Uruguayan footballer Luis Suarez paid the price for his latest biting incident today. FIFA took the unprecedented step of banning him from all football-related activities for four months. It has not only ended his World Cup, it also missed the start of the new Premier League season with Liverpool. The Uruguayans say they'll appeal. From Brazil, our sports editor Steve Scott reports. Luis Suarez must have been hoping FIFA would uphold its reputation for turning a blind eye to scandal. Not today. An unprecedented punishment with ramifications stretching far and beyond this World Cup. Such behaviour can not be tolerated on any football pitch, and in particular not at the FIFA World Cup, when the eyes of millions of people are on the stars on the field. FIFA have suspended Suarez from Uruguay's next nine matches and given him a four-month ban from all football-related activity. That means he'll miss Liverpool's first nine Premier League games and three Champions League matches. In addition, there's the potential of two domestic League Cup games. That's 23 matches in total, excluding any pre-season friendlies. Outside Uruguay, there is little sympathy for Suarez and his actions. His biggest sponsors, Adidas, said today they supported FIFA's decision and would discuss their future partnership with him after the World Cup. The man who runs world football was keeping his thoughts to himself today, but privately, Sepp Blatter knows only a strong message and Suarez's expulsion from his beloved tournament would pacify public opinion. Suarez will appeal, but on reflection, the team around him may conclude their energies are better spent addressing the question that still hangs in the air. What is it that makes a man resort to such base and animalistic outbursts of violence? Steve Scott, ITV News, Rio de Janeiro. Well, we'll return to Steve Scott in Rio in just a moment. But first, the Liverpool, Damon Green is outside Anfield for us. And Damon, this is going to have a big impact on the club, isn't it? It is. The offence may have been committed in Brazil, it may have been committed in a Uruguay shirt, but it's here in the city of Liverpool that the impact will be most felt. Nine Premier League games he'll miss, three Champions League games. The supporters may have a great deal of affection for him, but today they weren't making any excuses. To get banned for, for life, you know what I mean? It's the fair time that he's done it, you know what I mean? What, he might do it again. Well, you know, he deserves everything, I guess, you know what I mean? He's on the good money, you know, we should be going around doing that. I understand why he got banned for the Uruguay, but not for the Liverpool. Like, he misses some important games for Liverpool now. Liverpool have issued a statement today saying they'll wait and see until they've had time to review the FIFA disciplinary committee report before making any further comment. It's worth bearing in mind that in the four months Luis Suarez will be banned, Liverpool Football Club will pay him around £3 million. Thanks very much, Damon. Let's go back to Steve Scott in Rio then. And Steve, so we now have this appeal process. What happens next specifically? Well, Mark, that process is underway. I don't expect it to make any difference to the World Cup here. FIFA, of course, simply couldn't afford to see Luis Suarez uh, kicking another football in Brazil. But what is interesting is this grey area as how uh, it affects Liverpool, because we're in new territory here. FIFA, for the first time, has effectively punished a club for something that a player has done on the international stage. Now, that situation has never been tested before, and I guess that uh, Liverpool's lawyers will have plenty to say when they manage to look at the fine print of this judgment, and that's whether the club wants Luis Suarez to stay at Liverpool or not. All right, Steve, thank you very much indeed. The former News of the World editor Rebecca Brooks said today she felt vindicated by the unanimous not guilty verdicts of the phone hacking jury. She told reporters outside her central London home that the last few years had been tough on her family. Our political correspondent Emily Morgan has more. Two days after Rebecca Brooks walked free from court, she finally broke her silence. With her husband by her side, she emerged from her home to tell the nation she was always innocent. I am innocent of the crimes that I was charged with, and I feel vindicated by the unanimous verdicts. But when I was arrested, it was in the middle of a maelstrom of controversy, of politics and of comment. Some of that was fair, but much of it was not. So I'm grateful for the jury. Uh, I'm very grateful for the jury for coming to their decision. Emotional and her voice breaking, she spoke of the toll the case had taken. 
The last few years um, have been tough for both of us and for those closest to us. But more importantly, they've been tough for everybody on all sides. We've always tried to keep our troubles in perspective. I mean, after all, you know, we're, we have a, a happy and healthy daughter. We have our brave and resolute mums that have been at court uh, most of the time. She would, she said, learn from this and left her husband to answer questions about her former colleague and lover, Andy Coulson, who was convicted. I'm really concerned for Andy and Aloise and their family. Um, we wish them well. Have, have you spoken, spoken to Andy to on the Coulson? phone? No, I haven't. No. You haven't? All eyes are now on Rebecca Brooks's next move. She was once one of the most powerful in British media, but now just wants to spend time with her family. Emily Morgan, ITV News, Central London. Now, housing bubble, what housing bubble? The Bank of England Governor Mark Carney denied there was one today, but he did put in place new caps on risky lending as what he called an insurance policy for the economy. Our economics editor, Richard Edgar, is here. What exactly did he have to say? Well, first, he's asking lenders to make sure that borrowers could afford their mortgage repayments, even if interest rates were to go up by an extra three percentage points. So on an average mortgage, that would take it to about 7%. It's also going to cap the number of risky loans that lenders can issue. Risky here means a loan that is four and a half times a borrower's salary or more. And banks and building societies won't be able to issue more than one in seven of their um, loans at these risky um, levels. And this morning, the government, governor told me what these new rules are meant to stop. Um, a potential shift of that into reckless, widespread, high loan to income, high loan to value, riskier lending tomorrow, a shift that we've seen in this country countless times in past housing cycles, that can't happen. But prices would have to rise another 20% over the next three years for these rules to have any effect on the market. So this hasn't been the sledgehammer that some people were expecting on housing. All right, Richard, thank you. The Prime Minister used the backdrop of World War I commemorations in Belgium to launch his own offensive over Europe today. But David Cameron faces humiliation as his bid to block Jean-Claude Juncker becoming the next European Commission president looks doomed to fail. Our Europe editor, James Mates, reports. Gathered under the Menin Gate in the Belgian town of Ypres, the 28 leaders of the EU mark the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the First World War. Under a monument built to remember the tens of thousands who died in this corner of Flanders and to hear the sounding of the last post as it is sounded here every night. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. David Cameron took the opportunity to look at the name of his great-great-uncle carved in the Menin Gate, John Geddes, killed here in April 1915 on the second day of the Second Battle of Ypres. Today is all about creating an image of unity, a determination that political rows should not overshadow a day of solemn commemoration. By the time they get to Brussels tomorrow, the atmosphere may be very different. Because the biggest row in Europe in more than two years is about to end in a humiliating defeat for David Cameron. 26 of the 28, led by Germany's Angela Merkel, will tomorrow vote to install a man at the head of the EU who Cameron had promised to block. There's now talk of consequences. Everything has consequences uh, in life, and obviously I think that uh, proceeding in the way that countries are planning to proceed, choosing this individual, I believe that's the wrong approach. And I think that will be bad, not just, uh, I think it'll be bad for Europe. I think they're making a mistake. But it's very important in Europe that you say what you say in private, and it's the same as what you say in public. They placed poppies in a newly commissioned memorial in Ypres this evening. Tomorrow, it'll be a return to Britain outvoted, Britain against the rest. In other words, pretty much back to business as usual. James Mates, ITV News, Ypres. Still to come this evening, British scientists give their starkest warning yet that we need to cut back on sugar. And the resistant rodents, why this rat won't take the poison. We'll have that and more when we come back.
Welcome back. The recommended daily allowance of sugar will be halved under new government guidelines, which means just one can of fizzy drink a day would be the limit. The new proposals say that no more than 5% of calories should come from sugar, compared with current limits of 10%. Our health editor Catherine Jones reports. As a nation, we eat more sugar than is currently recommended. But today, the government science advisers said those daily limits of sugar intake must be halved to just 25 grams of added sugar for a woman and 35 grams for a man. It will mean a massive shift in our eating habits. But the scientists say it's imperative that message is now driven home to people. It is definitely the job of, of government agencies, in, in this context it will be Public Health England, to, to increase the, the, um, the strength and find ways of increasing the effectiveness of the messages. So how does Public Health England propose to toughen up the message about sugar? Its proposals include reassessing if juice and smoothies should still count as one of your five a day, investigating whether a tax on sugary drinks would help, plus looking into restrictions on food adverts online that are aimed at kids. People need to think about reducing their sugar intake because too much sugar does you a harm. One can of fizzy drink will take you up to the new limit. People need to be told that in the starkest terms. It's not about choice anymore. Well, our research shows us that some consumers are turned off by those very directive messaging. The case for reducing our sugar intake to combat obesity and ill health is clear. Public Health England will present ministers with its proposals about how to try to achieve that early next year. Catherine Jones, ITV News. Down and Street insists Abu Qatada will not be returning to Britain after being cleared of terrorism charges. The Muslim preacher was extradited to Jordan from the UK last July following an eight-year battle against deportation. The UK's population increased by around 400,000 last year, according to the latest official figures. The Office for National Statistics estimated that there were 64.1 million people in the country. And the UK's big six energy firms have been referred to the Competition and Markets Authority. The regulator Ofgem says soaring housing bills highlighted the need for investigation after profits quadrupled to more than £1 billion in three years. Genetically mutated super rats immune to common poisons are spreading across the UK at an alarming rate. Research shared with ITV's Tonight programme found these rats in all of the 17 counties where testing took place. This report from our consumer editor, Chris Choi. The first images of a live super rat. Though it looks no different, it has a natural mutation in its DNA. New research released today shows there are more of these in more areas of Britain than previously thought. I think people should be concerned about um, these rats and resistant rats uh, because of public health concerns because they carry uh, diseases that can cause, cause death and like wheels disease um, and various other bacteria. New DNA tests show areas where 100% of the rats tested were resistant to poisons in parts of Yorkshire. Kent, also in Reading, Swindon and parts of Gloucestershire, in Bishop's Castle, Shropshire, Fakenham in Norfolk, as well as Dumfries and Galway in Scotland. Well, we spotted it probably back in November, I think. Families who are infested find that the most commonly used chemicals have little effect. So I started putting down my own poison and uh, they seemed to eat that like it was candy. This is one of the areas where they can eat the poison and survive. Right. What kind of effect do you think is that going to have for people like you trying to get rid of them? Well, I guess you've just got to hope that something else comes along that will kill them because they're not going to go away forever, are they? They'll be back again at some point. Poisons are available that even the super rats can't survive. The government is now deciding whether stronger chemicals should be authorised for wider use. Some in the industry believe that without that, Britain is heading for a pest control crisis. You can trap a few rats um, but controlling an infestation is going to be extremely difficult uh, and unless we, we have access to these poisons to use in these situations, um, it's going to be pretty disastrous I think for rat control. Natural selection has given these rats an evolutionary advantage. The decisions officials make in the next few months will shape how we fight back. Chris Choi, ITV News. 
And you can see Chris's full report, The Rise of the Super Rats, tonight on ITV at half past seven. Now, after four days of Wimbledon, Andy Murray is the only British player left in either the men's or women's singles. Heather Watson lost her second round match this evening. Our sports correspondent Ian Payne reports. How are you feeling today, Heather? Are you confident? Heather Watson arrived at Wimbledon this morning knowing she had to do something she'd never done before, beat an opponent in the world's top ten. She started nervously, a double fault giving Kerber the first game, and she lost the set 6-2. But she started swinging more freely in the second set and eventually won it 7-5. Into the deciding set and suddenly Watson's game started to look fragile once more, making several unforced errors. And before she knew it, it was all over. Penultimate Brit out of the singles, and then there was just one, Andy Murray. So Germany have won again, and Heather Watson will be wondering what happened between that second set when she was so competitive and the third set when her game seemed to fall apart. But she is outside the top 50 in the world, so she shouldn't be surprised losing to the world number nine. Earlier on centre court, Rafa Nadal came very close to going out against the man who beat him two years ago, Lucas Rasol, but eventually he won in four sets. So it's over to you, Andy Murray. Thanks, Ian. On ITV News later tonight, America goes crazy for World Cup soccer, as they call it, as their team reaches the knockout stages. We report on how millions more Americans are starting to get it at last. Well, join us both for that after tonight's football at 11.15. But for now, goodbye. You'll stay up, won't you? Bye-bye. <laughs>